Thanks for joining us. My name is Scylla Robinson. I'm a partner in the employment and safety team at Clayton Youths. And today I'm joined with two fabulous guests to talk about diversity, equity and inclusion. We really want to have a discussion where we look beyond uh, beyond the lens and, and have a really candid discussion about the state of play in Australia. Um, I think it feels like we're moving backwards. Um, I think that my guests agree with me on that front. And, and really we've got a case where the business case is really strong for diversity, equity, inclusion, but it seems like corporate Australia and beyond is stagnating. It feels like we're asleep at the wheel and I really hope that today's discussion prompts some um, thinking at your end. So in terms of my two fantastic guests, I've got Catherine Fox, who's a leading commentator on women in the workforce, an award-winning journalist and author and presenter to audiences on, around Australia. Catherine was appointed a member of the Order of Australia for significant service to journalism, gender equality and diversity in 2022. And we also have Giles Gunasekera, a founder and CEO of the Global Impact Initiative and has 25 years of experience building and developing teams, businesses and business strategies for global enterprises, creating innovative, sustainable business that generates positive social impact. In January 2023, Giles was awarded the Medal of an Order of Australia for his service to social welfare to the community. So without further ado, let's get into it. As I mentioned before, it feels like we've been asleep at the wheel in Australia a little bit. That's my perspective and that we haven't been making a lot of progress. Catherine, where do you think we are now in Australia? Well, thanks for having me. And it's fantastic to be here with both of you. Um, watch with great delight the work that you do. Um, so thank you very much for including me. Um, I think I, I do agree with you, Scylla. I don't think we're making enormous progress. and. The reason I say that is not because I just sort of dreamt it up, but I keep a very close eye on the evidence, uh, the data that we yeah. have, whether it's Bureau of Statistics data, whether it's the Workplace Gender Equality Agency's excellent database. So we actually know that in many measures, uh, we, we have not made progress. Mm. At the best, you could probably stay where, say we're plateauing. Mm. Um, so we know that the gender pay gap, for example, is around 14%. It's widened slightly, but we certainly haven't reduced it significantly. Uh, there are fewer women in senior ranks than there have been, not in the management area. So there are more women managers in that mid-tier, but in the very senior realms, there are just 6% or so women CEOs in the ASX 200, mm. which is a miserably small figure and mm. has barely changed. Mm. Um, now, this is not unrelated to the pandemic, mm. so we do have to take that into account. Unfortunately, we could not point to massive amounts of progress before the pandemic. Indeed. So I think what you'd have to say is the pandemic exacerbated um, mm. some ongoing uh, problems um, and a real inertia mm. in this country, particularly, unfortunately, in the business community, despite some examples that show us progress has been made in mm. pockets. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting in terms of the pandemic, I've heard some people from a culturally and linguistically diverse background mm. say that the pandemic was actually great in terms of being at home, not having to deal with the daily microaggressions mm. that they experience in the workplace. Um, but of course, it also has the effect that they're not able to mm. have face time with the people of influence that may otherwise, you know, default to the affinity bias that might mean that they're not necessarily on the radar in terms of promotions and those kind of things. And I feel obliged to add that the Grattan Institute estimated women picked up an extra hour a day of unpaid labour. So let's not. <laughs> no doubt. Yes, that's, that's very bag. underestimated. I'm sure. I, was say, I was going to say. Uh, and also, I mean, the the pandemic also um, uh, continued to um, shine a light on the the inequalities. You know, mm. if if you are sending a man, you know, under the you know underground or into a high risk job, mm. you know, they they get a premium for that. Mm. But in the pandemic. You know, the high risk jobs were nurses, doctors, mm. you know, retail, uh, retail workers, uh, predominantly females who did not get teachers. any pay rises, teachers mm. um, did not get any pay rises. Um, and that, you know, and, and not only, you know, had to do their job, but then also took on those additional mm. responsibilities mm. Um, on the on the domestic front. So, mm. um, yeah, it's it, that that gap, as, as Catherine said, has just got wider. Mm. And yes, 
you know, we can use COVID as an excuse for a, for a certain period of time, um, but that's not an excuse um, mm. because we, at the end of the day, we're talking about human beings. And yes, gone through um, a really terrible time, you know, from a health perspective, but, you know, ultimately yeah. we need to get, as you say, we need to get behind the wheel again mm. and start mm. driving. And that's the interesting thing. I mean, we have the data. You've just mentioned a few <laughs> statistics that are there, but it seems that in Australia we do, there's a, there's a bit of a, well, a bit of a backlash. There's a significant backlash mm. um, to a lot of DE&I initiatives. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's Australian specific reasons for that? I mean, it feels like we are behind the eight ball. I, I'm conscious that I'm being very negative, but mm. I get quite stroppy about these things compared to some of our other, um, you know, you know, first world countries that we compare ourselves to. Your views on just the yeah, Australia specific challenges that we might have? Oh, there's no doubt yeah. that we have fallen behind yeah. comparable economies. Um, mm. And just to sort of go from one of the very broad points that you just touched on, the male breadwinner mm. model mm. is more deeply embedded in this country and all the things that are contingent on that, mm. which of course come down to pay gaps and so mm. on, um, than many other mm. OECD mm. countries mm. on the Global Gender Gap Index. Mm. Uh, we've, we've gone down enormously. So mm. we used to be about 15 mm. on that, um, mm. and we've gone down to 50th. Uh, so That's on a terrible. whole lot of really valid measures, mm. um, we can mm. see that Australia is not faring mm. well. Mm. Um, why that is, of course, we could talk about for another couple of hours. Do you have a very, um, as I said, a male breadwinner model? Um, a lot of the people in charge are still blokes. Mm. I mean, there's no, there's no question about that. We mm. know that. Um, but we also have very strong gender norms in this country. Mm. And I think we tend to sort of laugh it off and say, oh, it's a man's world, it's a bloke's world mm. and so on. I think we shouldn't discount how mm. deeply embedded that is mm. um, in our structures, in our tax system, in mm. the way we don't fund childcare in an efficient yeah. um, and accessible way. Yeah. Um, in our culture, in the way we talk to each other mm. um, and a whole lot of those areas. So it's really pervasive. And you only have to talk, don't you, to someone who's moved here mm. from overseas. Oh, and the utter shock from mm. men and women mm. yes. about the culture here. Mm. Yeah. And it makes you understand, and I've lived overseas, I'm sure mm. you have, that mm. you do notice those differences. Mm. It's really pervasive. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean. Um, particularly, you know, countries like Singapore, like, like on our doorstep, mm, Singapore, mm. Malaysia. I mean, Malaysia is just this fantastic, you know, case study of diversity, right? I mean, mm. I remember doing some teaching in, in Malaysia and I said, I said to the students well, during one of the lunch breaks, I said, how come you guys just embrace each other's culture? And they said, because we get time off and we get to eat, you know? <laughs> uh, and it was as simple as that, you know, for a lot of them. But, you know, it was the, you know, the, the Muslims, you know, love Chinese New Year, mm. Chinese New Year, uh, Chinese love Ramadan. And mm. the Christians, you know, they all enjoy each other's um, religious holidays mm. because that's a time, because they know that's a time of celebration for their mm. fellow countrymen. Mm. But also there's a celebration around it. There's food, there's interaction, there's entertainment. Mm. And it's really disappointing in a country like Australia where we talk about multiculturalism, mm. but mm. It's, not, it, it, it's not replicated anywhere really mm. in, in any meaningful way. Mm. Um, some government department, I do some work with government departments in some, some government departments um, are, are definitely got making really good strides in gender and and also on the on the diversity side but when you look throughout you know particularly corporate australia mm. um you know this constant you know well you can only be on a board if you're you know over 60 and you've been a ceo and you're white um, and you're male and you've been to a private uh, male or female and you've been to a private school mm. you know that's just the model mm. um, and it really has to change. Yes, it does. Mm. And it can change. It can, mm. yeah. Um, I think unfortunately we're at a real stalemate mm. at the moment and um, I suspect those uh, listening to us um, may find that at the coalface this is a tough argument actually yeah. to have and I call it an argument. I mean, I think you've got to be quite proactive about it but gosh, it puts people off. Mm. Yeah. Um, it is about power and who has power mm. um, and it's not about low hanging fruit mm. so I'm well known for being a little uh, critical shall yeah. we say of efforts to sort of fix women mm. uh, so send them off to workshops because yeah. they're the problem I think we used to call that blaming the victim yeah. um, and that has made no difference whatsoever in fact it embeds the stereotypes yeah. uh, it says to women you actually lack confidence and risk taking appetite so you're you're the problem yep. um, and 
by the way, any evidence of that is, is clearly symptoms, not cause. Yes. Uh, so we really do have to look at the demand side instead of constantly saying, if you women only got your act together mm -hmm. um, and you girls at school only made the right subject choices, right. then all of this would fade away and yeah. everything would be fine. There is no yeah. evidence that mm. that is the case. Um, and so the other thing I would say after decades of reporting on the business world in this area is that for a long time, what I heard from very senior people was, make the business case, mm. um, show us the data and make the business case and all will be well. Now, I used to suck that up and think, yes, I'm writing for a financial newspaper. Of course, that's the answer. Mm. But as the evidence accumulated, there was no shift. Yeah. Um, and it struck me that probably, and I definitely was part of this problem, mm. uh, I think we took a wrong turn with that because mm. the idea was there that you women, you 51% of the population, mm. have to justify yeah, your right. right Mm. to a job yeah. uh, and your full rights, human yeah. rights, as a citizen of your country. It's just, and, yeah. and as I say, the evidence actually has always been there. We've got more and more of it, mm. including in the last couple of years, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency and Curtin University's data, mm. showing the more diversity at the top, the better your financial returns. Yeah. Not a causal relationship, a direct correlation disappeared without mm. a trace. Mm. So the business case has been made time and again. Mm. Um, this is um, this is much tougher nut to crack, yeah. 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 And, and to that point, I mean, there's, uh, in addition to that research you mentioned, Catherine, uh, there's Credit Suisse and also JP Morgan data as well that shows um, the impact of adding, diver or adding a female to a board or to a, a decision-making um, position. Yeah. And they looked at a portfolio of, of companies where there was one female on the board and then a portfolio of companies where there was three plus mm -hmm. and there was, a, there was a big difference in share price. So, you know, to that point, uh, surprise, surprise, yeah. but, you know, there's just one, you know, example and there's been several of those studies that have been done that shows, yes, not only, you know, do we all conceptually know that diversity in a room, make, you know, you, it helps you make better decisions, mm -hmm. but now, you know, it ac actually impacts your share price. Mm. And you know what? There's a really simple, there are no simple things about this. <laughs> it is complicated. But I remember John McFarlane many years ago when he was CEO at ANZ and he was asked at a big forum, what, what's the one thing? And he said, promote more women. Yeah. And I've often thought of that because mm. actually that's exactly right. Yes. Um, mm. Promote more people mm. uh, that are not from that yeah. mainstream. Look yeah. at your, and if you're saying, oh no, it's done on merit, then you really need to go back yeah. Yeah. and look yeah. at your systems and look at bias yeah. and you need to intervene. Yeah. Don't just think this will all happen. Mm. The pipeline theory, which we again yeah. sucked up for years, as long as we get more women. Well, look at law. Yeah. Women have been outgraduating men yeah. in legal schools around Australia for decades. Yeah. Uh, they're everywhere. Yeah. Um, and yet, of course, the change at the top has not been yeah. automatically delivered. So it is about intentional action mm. um, and it is about examining a whole lot of smaller things yeah. but they do add up to um, you know big changes but um, yes that one about having a quantum a critical mm. mass of women is a really important one yeah. the other one that's often overlooked I suspect Giles is that um, the data shows quite clearly that women in leadership promote more women mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. This idea yeah. that women all stab each other in the back, there is yeah. no evidence for that. It's quite the reverse. So yeah. you want it to change through your organisation, make yeah. sure you've got more women. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. I think that sort of segues nicely into the backlash piece as mm. well that we have, because there's this perception, I think, in, in corporate Australia that you know, D&I, DE&I, it's done and dusted. There's women in the ranks. People can see more women. Mm. The sense is that the the men, the middle-aged men, the ones that you referenced, mm. are you know beyond those called John in the ASX, you know, one hundred boards, are overtly, um, you know, aligning against this perceived threat of mm. the women, mm. and yet I don't see the women aligning in any way <laughs> to try and and resist that, and I think that, you know, and again. It's, it's this issue of what are we trying to do and it shouldn't be the women or the culturally diverse women or, um, you know, people from the LGBTI com plus community that needs to resolve things. But I think there's, whether it's an Australian thing or just across the board, we ourselves are sometimes impacted by that merit. You know, I don't want to be perceived as the token mm. ethnic. Mm. And so there's just layer upon layer mm. of inhibition 
for people to take opportunities that are sometimes there, combined with then this backlash, yep. it's just, it's quite toxic, really, mm. the current climate, because there's this perception that we've, mm. we've done it. Mm. We really haven't. Mm. Nobody wants to be putting their hand up to be the culturally diverse or linguistically mm. diverse, you know, person. Yeah. It's, it's really hard. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's hard. And there's also a lot of PTSD that goes along with yeah. it too, for a lot of people, um, uh, having recently gone through some um, unconscious bias training for um, a board that I'm on, um, all the people in the, of colour in the room were really, um, I mean, it was a great training session, but mm -hmm. for two days we're hearing about bias and racism and we're all sitting there going, yep, that happened at that age, mm. that happened at this age, that happened at this age, this happened last week, you know, all these yeah. things, these theories or examples that were given, like people are actually living through that. Mm. And, you know, I see it as well in the Indigenous community where so many Indigenous people get tapped on the shoulder saying, oh, you know, can you come into this meeting? Can you present? Can you represent your community? Mm. And they're going, well, firstly, I don't yes. represent the yeah, whole Indigenous yeah. community. Uh, but two, I've been doing this mm. for five years, 10 yep. years, and I'm exhausted. Yeah. Um, go do, and do the I work. I every welcome to country. <laughs> yeah, and has. there has to be a, you know, a, a point in time where, you know, and it's now where you just say, go and do the work, please. Mm. Like go and educate yourself mm. on what it means, you know, what, what our First Nations people do, you know, their culture, um, their heritage, their practices, you know, um, if you don't know, there's plenty of courses that you can go on. So mm. stop relying on the one or two people that you've got in your organisation, mm. you know, to, to help you through it because it's not their job. Like it's it's our job, yeah. you know. It's our job too. Very much a compliance mentality too, yeah. isn't yeah, it? It's not so. like oh, we yeah. would just do a box yeah. tick those boxes. Yeah. I think, um, Scylla, the the area of backlash, um, if you win, I lose, is is very much yes. informally the thought there. I think the business community suffers a lot from something Michelle Ryan, who runs the Global Institute for Women's Leadership in Canberra, for you know the Julia Gillard's body, yeah. she says is over-optimism. Mm. And I, she said, I see a lot of this in the business world, yeah. where it's, oh, we've done this, yeah. um, you know, we are, um, you know, we are diverse, yeah. we are, you know, yeah. no tolerance for anything else. Yeah. And then she says what they often do is wheel out very crude top-level stats saying yeah. we employ 55% yeah. yes. women. Well, if we drill into that, clearly yes. we're going to find they're clustered in lower skilled, lower paid jobs, Correct. they're less likely to be promoted, they spend longer at every mm. rung of the la You know, it, that's, not, that's not enough. Yep. But on the backlash, what's come out in the last probably two to three years, mm. um, including in an excellent study um, Deloitte Access Economics did last year on gender norms, um, is that um, younger men in this country mm. have much more traditional ideas about who should do the work mm. and what kind of work should be done if they're in a partnership, a heterosexual one, mm. so their careers and their jobs taking priority and so on. Mm. So we've actually got a bit of an issue uh, with even younger men. In fact, uh, their attitudes were more conservative and traditional mm. than baby boomers. Mm. So isn't that wow. an interesting, an yeah. indictment really of some of those, those attitudes mm. that people carry? Could, could that also be, Catherine, that they have also been hearing it for a long time. So in their minds, they may have, they may think that it's been done. A bit yeah. like some of these corporates saying, well, we've got the D diversity, equity and inclusion committee, so we've done that, mm. you know. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, particularly, and I'm not defending young men, but I'm, I'm, mm. I'm, you know, putting, trying to put myself in their shoes because they've been hearing about it, they think it's happening, but it's not until you show them the data and say, well, actually it's not. Mm. <laughs> yes, yeah. but the idea that they're, um, jobs yes. um, are more important oh, no, than their partners, yeah, tells yeah, us that something hasn't shifted something hasn't around shifted. that male breadwinner model. Totally, and totally. completely agree there's quite a lot of what we call gender fatigue. Yeah. Um, but I also think there's been very little effort on actually showing, and there again is terrific evidence to back yeah. this up, as you know, Giles, that um, the more diverse you become, the more everyone can benefit. They look at it and say, well, that woman next to me is going to get, I hear it all the yeah. time, is going to get the job and I'm right. not. Mm. Now we have, the, the data shows the opposite. Mm. It's like saying, yeah. oh, I can't get onto a board yeah. mm. because I'm a white middle-aged man. Yeah. Well, have a look at the stats. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm told this quite a lot by yeah. friends, actually. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. So, oh, well, you know, I can't get onto a board. Mm. And I say, where's your data? Yeah. Where, yeah. where does that come from? Yeah. Because if anything, we're doing more poorly than most yeah. other economies. Yeah. So I think that that is very much in the yeah. ether. 
as well. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, it is interesting because I think the young men, I've had the same experience with, with men in the firm and young um, men that you know I experience out in in life at the surf club and those kinds of things. And I think it's, it's interesting in terms of looking at the generational difference because um, Gen X over here, husband like has seen the challenges that you've gone through and obviously different experience for boomers where it was that more traditional model and they've seen maybe it change for their you know wives daughters cousins what have you but there does also seem to be a sentiment with some young women that i'm not a feminist it's like it's passe and so it's this weird thing that you know perhaps it's younger people that are reverting back to this more traditional mindset because they think that it's done and dusted, mm. um, which is also quite concerning. Concerning mm. because, um, you know, there's only, we're trying to do it to pass the baton on as well to the next generation that seem to be sort of falling back to these more traditional mm. models. Maybe they've seen, you know, all of us working hard in a career, mm. having a family, and they say, you know what? Well, What's you know feminism what? done for us? They need a table. What, what I always say to them, <laughs> you needed to spend time with women of my mother's generation yeah. and yeah. hear mm. how difficult, yeah. limiting, yeah. and powerless they felt. So yeah. this kind yeah. of, I, I understand, Scylla, yeah. I agree, yeah. mm. but I always think, oh, you don't get it. No. No. Those women had nothing. No, they were absolutely. highly dependent. They were yeah. bright and smart. My mother yeah. left school at 14. Yeah. You know, yeah. she wasn't an unhappy person, but yeah. she said to her daughters, you go out yeah. and get a degree and have yeah. a career. So I think, you know, we have to sort of temper that a little bit yes. um, and understand. Also, I, the, the other side to that, and completely hear you on that, I've heard it too. Look at these young women like mm. Brittany Higgins yeah. and Grace Tame. Mm. Um, and Yasmin Poole, these extraordinary young mm. women in their 20s yeah. with unbelievable courage, um, standing up, speaking out against the odds mm. uh, and really not taking a backward step at some expense, clearly, um, literally, to their mental health uh, and their health generally. But they're extraordinary. So I have three daughters, I was going to say in my 20s, one's just turned 30. Um, and I actually see a real commitment to this and mm. an expectation mm. that they will be treated mm. fairly. Mm. Um, and they're much more outspoken mm. about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they are holding their employers to account a bit mm. too. Absolutely. And I'm pleased to see that. Mm. So yes, uh, we can, and I, I agree with you, the return of the white wedding, mm. absolutely stunning. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. And the number of young women changing their names mm. when they get married. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, it's wow. all it's mm. This is interesting. Mm. But I think, you know, if you're a sociologist, having read a bit in this area, you would say that sometimes those things are almost an appeasement. It's like, yeah. yes, yes, I can do this. Mm. Yes, I can compete with you yeah. because I have a very good yeah. degree yes. and I'm very good at my job. But don't worry, yes. we'll have the white wedding yeah. and I'll change my name. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting, it's not, I know it doesn't sound yeah, rational, yeah. but I think there's a few yeah. layers yeah. to yeah. that. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 It's interesting. I was just reflecting while we were talking, Giles, on your comment about Malaysia mm. and and I wonder whether in Malaysia where you know there's three dominant cultures in terms of Malay, Chinese and Indian mm. is it and, and also they've ha had the benefit of positive discrimination yes. for Malays mm. you know since the 70s yes. I wonder whether that you know essentially smaller diversity mm. than our bigger multicultural makes it sort of easier in a way because people can actually attach to, you know, Diwali yeah. or, you know what I mean, Ramadan yeah. and those things. It's, yeah. it's always less complex. I feel, you know, our multicultural country yeah. sometimes means that people say, you know, love Vietnamese food, I get banh mi for lunch. I, you know, we, we think we're awesome because yeah. we take advantage of the amazing, you know, culinary delights that having Asia on our doorstep yeah. gives us. Yeah. Um, but that together with this sort of Aussie attitude that, you know, you know, we're, we're robust, you know, we're all pretty tough. We just take it. it it's, it's just an interesting cultural yeah. overlay also, that I, I mean, wonder is yeah, a difference as well. You're absolutely right. Yes, there are, there are, I guess, by name, kind of three cultures, but yeah. there's subcultures within Indeed. those within those cultures. And then when you overlay religion, That's right. you know, Christianity, um, Islam, um, Hindu, Buddhism, you know, um, there's mm. all those other layers as well, mm. which are, you know, which, which are quite fascinating to watch, mm. uh, but also just add to the richness mm. as well. But also, 
you know, a place like Malaysia, they've got the diversity, you know, at a political level, at a corporate level. Mm. And so people can, you know, that it, that adage, you know, you, you can be what you see. Right. Um, and so people are seeing, um, you know, people that look like them mm. uh, that, are, that are there. And interestingly, and you know, another, um, I guess, Asian slash subcontinental example, uh, um, I was an uh, ambassador for the T20 World Cup for both the Women's World Cup and, and then the Men's World Cup. Yeah. And one of the bits of research that we did uh, th through the ICC in the lead up to the, particularly the Women's World Cup, was that subcontinental men, you know, cricket mad subcontinental men did, want, did not want to watch women's cricket. They weren't oh, that interested. Oh, there you go. Yeah. How interesting. So a lot of community engagement events that we did in the lead up, you know, deliberately went out there and engaged, you know, men mm. to say, you know, come along, watch mm. the game. It's cricket. You know, who cares? You know, <laughs> they're going to have fun because it's cricket. It's your number one religion. Um, That's right. And so um, we did all that engagement, community events, and then looked at the numbers and compared it to previous, you know, World Cups, but the Women's World Cup, there were much more, many more um, subcontinental men um, at the games. Um, and they brought, you know, their wives, they, their, you know, their children, um, other members of the family as well. Um, and, you know, really, and it was across, you know, not just subcontinental men, but, you know, West Indians, um, you know, English, Australians. So it was a really good um, example of getting more men involved in, you know, in, in, in the process mm. and the education mm. actually led to a much more diverse mm. tournament mm. Um, and a better outcome for the game. Yeah. It's, I mean, one of the things I think is important to, <coughs> to talk about is the positives, yes. um, because mm. I think we need to be able to emulate, um, and that's, that's a terrific example. Yeah. Um, I always say that norms can change. Yeah. It feels like they can't. Mm. Women's sport is one of them. Yes. When I was growing up, it was laughable, and I mean that, mm. laughable to think women would ever professionally play mm. AFL mm. or yeah. cricket. Yeah. It, was, it was, you were considered an idiot if yeah. you even suggested it. It was certainly not an option at school. Yeah. Um, that shifted. Yeah. Uh, it continues to shift. Um, the other one is same-sex marriage. Um, mm. Awful process that we yeah. had in this country. Yeah. But interesting to see that nearly two thirds of the population said, "Yeah, that's your that's your call. Mm. We're not we're not yeah. standing there." That's a huge shift again yeah. from when I was growing up. Both of those things I think are worth mentioning. Yeah. Um, and another one, it, a bit more specific, but been in my head because I've just been interviewed about some research women in media yeah. has done, and I'm. I, I work with them a bit, showing that only 30% of experts uh, quoted in the media are women. So right. a very low figure. Mm. Uh, it's up a bit from when they last did it. Mm. But one of the examples I wanted to give of how we can change that is women economists. Yeah. Mm. Now, how many times do you see RBA interest rate rise? Mm. They're all over the news. A lot of them are women. Mm. That's only in the last few years. Mm. When I was growing up again, and in yeah. fact, even 10 years ago, it was all men. Yeah. Now it is absolutely yeah. normal to yeah. see and culturally diverse women mm. in these extraordinary jobs and they're yeah. fantastic. Mm. That's been normalised quite quickly. Yes. Um, number of factors, one of which was a group called Women in Economics yeah. Yeah. who got behind it yeah. um, and have rallied and inspired and supported yeah. women, including younger women, yeah. uh, to do that. So we can shift this, you know, it can be done. Yeah. has to be absolutely planned and intentional, as I mentioned. But yeah. These things are not set in stone. I know it can sometimes feel as though we're butting our heads against a mm. brick wall. Mm. Um, and some of us really do have a rather large lump from doing that <laughs> for quite a long time. But I do look at those things and yeah. think, you know, we can make this yeah. change, yeah. but we do have to have that commitment, um, yeah. Yeah. the intention. Yeah. 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 It's interesting, isn't it, when you're thinking about the equality versus equity piece in terms of, you know, having the equal opportunity you know, to have that equal playing field versus actually levelling mm. the the playing field. Um, and it's just a concept that people who aren't in this space mm. don't really grasp, you know, like, yeah, women and men, they've got the same opportunities at work. Mm. You know, again, you've got the merit fallacy, you know, just disregarding all of the levels of privilege and bias yeah. and sort of structural impediments that impact um, you know, non-white men, to be frank. I'm interested in, you, you've both worked with so many different organisations and had so many different experiences. Um, what are you seeing of organisations that they're doing well? We've, we've, we've been a little bit negative in our mm. chat today and I'll take full responsibility um, for that because I get quite irate about these things. But in terms of, you know, organisations that you're working with, you, you both do work with lots of different organisations in different capacities. 
What are some of the good news stories, do you think? Well, just to add on to the women in economics mm. story, which I think is really potent. I think there are a number of organisations, I'd sort of qualify this by saying they're not in one particular sector. Mm. I, I don't think you can say that. In yeah. fact, funnily enough, occasionally it's male dominated mm. sectors that yeah. will be slightly more progressive, mm. uh, possibly because the stats are pretty pretty low mm. um, and they, they tackle it. But um, a number of organisations have conducted proper gender pay equity audits mm. Mm. and closed the pay gap. Mm. Uh, Energy Australia did it mm. a number of years ago. Um, and I noticed recently, I don't have background on this, but I read that Lion, the um, alcohol company, a um, beverages company, had done it as well. Um, so I think, you know, being rigorous um, and actually looking at the data, and by the way, you always have to go back every year to ensure that doesn't yeah. change, but yeah. but actually doing that. And um, I think the tools are there. It's not, you know, yes, it's a bit time consuming, but it can be done. Um, so I think the other one that I think is just outstanding, Alison Merrams, who runs Robert Co, which is a construction company, yeah. She's an engineer by background, um, has just gone in and said, right, we're going to have more women in this workforce mm. and we're going to change some of the norms. Mm. And she's abandoned the six day week, mm. which is, as anyone from construction knows, quite yeah. you know, set in stone. Yeah. Yeah. And she said, we're not doing it because it's not good for any of yeah. our employees. Yeah. Um, not for women, but not for the men who have families. Yeah. So she was warned that if she yeah. did that, they'd mm. lose business and that's not been the case. Yeah. Um, and she's yeah. quite an inspiration. And I just think those examples of someone coming in mm. with that commitment, mm. um, and it doesn't have to be a woman, uh, but I think that that change uh, yeah. can happen. Yeah, interestingly, we've seen it. Um, so another engineering example, Snyder Electric, which, you know, big, big global engineering firm, mm. does a lot of work, obviously, in renewables and solar and battery. They've had a big push on yeah. getting more female engineers mm. into their organisation, which has led to more females in senior management, but also on the board. Um, and interestingly, um, the US tech sector, which you would definitely not say um, was the bastions of uh, equality, yeah. um, some of the uh, equality um, initiatives, are, um, you know, are, are, are definitely coming through now. And interestingly, it's because there's a person, person of colour um, that's sitting at the top of the, yeah. those businesses. Yeah. So if you look at, you know, the Apples, the, the Googles, um, you know, that the Silicon Valley, um, yeah. you know, is is has got a very very high population of people of uh, people of colour that are leading those organisations yeah. um, that are not just you know engineers anymore right. and. Um, Recent data, is all, and recent data, and also some recent um, conversations uh, that that, are, that I've had with some of these firms is that they're now. Previously, they go to MIT and recruit. Now yeah. they're going to the Indian Institute of Technology first, oh, the and they're getting they they're, they're getting their you know they're, they're filling in the gaps with MIT. Yeah. Um, and and so that's you know that's kind of permeating through the organisation. A lot of work still to do. Um, and the US, uh, particularly the governance structure is a little bit flawed in that a lot of these big listed companies, the CEO and the chairman are the same person and they're, they're yeah. you, you know, yeah. um, usually male and, and usually white, yeah. um, which we don't have here in Australia. We don't have the, that particular challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and when you've got the CEO and the chair being the same person, yeah. <laughs> um, it just means that the whole board looks like them mm -hmm. <laughs> as well, or they're going to pick, pick people that are obviously going to agree with them. So yeah, there are, there, there are definitely pockets across all industries mm. where there's um, positive yeah. movement. And I know, you know, my background in financial services, mm. um, you know, for a long time, people used to say, oh, no, Giles, there's just not enough, you know, commerce or investment, you know, business graduates, accounting graduates, like um, <laughs> University of Sydney data, University of Melbourne data, you know, just G8 data shows that that is mm. false. Mm. You know, um, there are um, there, there is equality in mm. university in terms in, in terms of um, male, female, uh, in terms of qualifications across you know most faculties. Mm. Um, but you know, so the 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 argument that the pipeline's not there and we don't have enough graduates, it's it's just mm. false. It's mm. uh, it's another one of those um, chances to say um, you're not doing the work. <laughs> you know, uh, looking at the data. <laughs> well, you're relying on, and I'm I'm going to go back to merit because I have a definition of it which I didn't come up with, but I often cite, and I, I think it's always worth mentioning, that merit actually stands for mates elevated regardless of intellect or talent. <laughs> mates, because yeah. it can operate in any sphere and with so, any cohort. Yeah. Um, and we know that's one of the elements of bias, yeah. um, that you appoint people who look like you, yeah. uh, or you feel more comfortable with yeah. them. So I always think, you know, think about that word merit, yeah. um, and yeah. the idea that there's an even playing field because 
Yeah. There isn't. There isn't. <laughs> no, that's right. And I think that really is something that corporate Australia mm. still doesn't get in the main. And organisations like mine, professional services, where that meritocracy is so ingrained, mm. it does make the progress mm. much harder. But that, that fallacy that it's based on a level playing field, mm. when it's just not, mm. is, is, is a concept that people don't, you know, mm. in the main, mm. seem to have their heads around, which is yeah. really disappointing because they can point to discrimination occurring here or there, but it's just that structural and systemic privilege that is always there that, you know, intelligent professional people still don't quite get their heads around. I have stand-up yeah. arguments with people about it mm. often. I think it's personally affronting. Yeah. Mm. If you're it's, someone it's who's risen to the top yeah. 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 and someone's actually saying to you, yeah. some of that mm. was not due to mm. your unique and extraordinary talent. <laughs> it was due to the fact yeah. that you walk around in a male white body. Yeah. That can be pretty confronting. Yes. Um, so yeah. I think that there is, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this, I, I understand. Yeah. I, I, I see that yeah. and I think that that's a very difficult thing for a lot of people yeah. to process. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it is good for corporate Australia to see that there is mm. change in other parts mm. of, you know, the fabric of the Aussie culture. So, you know, you've mentioned the sports situation in terms of cricket. Um, you know, I think when we were chatting before, you were mentioning, you know, the arts, you know, in so many different pockets um, working in different ways. But I guess so much, <laughs> so much work to still to still be done. Yeah, and that's why we need to keep talking about it. Mm. Um, you know, talking about it honestly, transparently, mm. um, and and men need to get on board. Mm. Yeah, um, you know, gender is is really important because fifty percent of the population are not getting the mm. same opportunities as yeah. the other fifty percent. But then we need to take that a step further um, and just look at you know broader diversity around um, around cultural backgrounds, around religion, uh, around sexual preference, around age. Mm. You know, why do you have to be 60 plus to be a board director? I mean, one of the most um, exciting, inspiring board positions I ever had, I was on the board of Amnesty International for eight years. We went from a two million turnover organisation to a 30 million turnover organisation in those eight years. And we had, um, I was one of two males on the board mm. out of a board of, was too big, uh, but a board of 14. Um, uh, we had an age group of 21 to 65. Wow. Um, we had, I was the only one that worked in the finance industry. We had people from all different walks of life. Um, being a human rights organisation, we had mm. quite a few lawyers. Um, but, you know, it, we really had, you know, great diversity and, you know, just seeing that in action um, mm. and, and just seeing you know, the input and the 21 year old was just an absolute rock star, the mm. sort of ideas he mm. came up with on a regular basis. And you go, wow, we just, you know, imagine that in the business world, mm. you know, where you've got people coming up with those sort of really interesting um, ideas. So mm. I have to keep pushing it, have to keep going for it. And, and quite frankly, men have to get more vocal in this space. And that's mm. why I'm always, you know, not backward in being forward, um, you know, not just myself, but mm. also encouraging other men mm. um, to get involved um, and to get engaged in the conversation, um, whether they want to do it publicly or privately, mm. I don't care, but you just got to get, you got to get involved. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's key to Catherine's point about not making it the women's problem or the yeah. culturally diverse people's problem, you know, exactly. everybody needs to actually muck in and try yeah. and change That's those right. systems. Yeah. I'm interested, Giles, you work with a lot of organisations that, you know, are focused on ESG and having that social impact. Mm. And and I know that, you know, that's not always in, you know, their sort of gender equity space. Mm. And do, do you see that the companies that are keen on working to, you know, reduce their carbon emissions and have, for example, an environment focusing on E in the mm. ESG, is there a corollary between what they're then doing across the other broader DNI space does you know does an interest in one mean that they are ticking the boxes across the other spaces? I'm just curious what your um, experience is. It's definitely a movement. I wouldn't yeah. I wouldn't say that everyone that's doing ESG is doing it you know right across the whole yeah. business. Some are doing the policy and going tick, mm. and then others are going a little bit deeper. Yeah. Um, 
it's really interesting, you know, um, particularly dealing with corporates, you know, they saying, oh, well, you know, the governance is easy, right? Because we've got 50% female, 50% yeah. male, you know, tick, but mm. then it's the broader diversity that we've obviously been talking about that's, mm. that's needed. Mm. Um, the S is always spoken about as, you know, the too hard, but I reckon that's yeah. is, uh, you know, how do we do that? How do we measure it? You know, da, 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 da. Mm. But that's actually the most exciting part for any corporate because mm. that's an opportunity to engage your employees. Mm. You know, what are you passionate about? Mm. What do you like? Um, you know, we've seen this big shift just simply in um, philanthropic and volunteering programs. Mm. I mean, one, you know, companies have gone down the path of actually giving time off, you know, yeah. for volunteering, yeah. but now they're actually saying, and, and I saw this happen in my own organisation um, or when I was working for, for an, another organisation where we said, okay, well, we, as a group, we're going to determine who the charities are that we support, and then there's going to be a, um, and then it became three charities, and then it became one, mm. and then it was all right. We're just going to support this one charity for the year, and we're going to give you a variety of different ways to contribute. So it could mm. be, you know, it, and it was youth off the streets. Yeah. So you could actually go and sit in a car or walk the streets with a youth worker. Um, that could be your your engagement. Um, others found that too confronting and they were happy to, you know, do a monthly donation. Um, others wanted to be involved in, you know, helping feed, um, you know, the youth and cook and, yeah. and do those sort of things. So it doesn't matter how you want to get engaged, there was kind of different ways of, of, of doing that. So that's been a big shift in a lot of corporate programs. Mm. But yes, the, the, the starting conversation around the, e, the S and the G um, typically does lead to, you know, to greater engagement because um, of really two simple things. You know, companies are motivated by what their customers think, mm. uh, what their, well, three things, their, what their shareholders think, what their customers think, and what their employees think. Yeah. Um, and employees and customers are the ones that are demanding companies do better yeah. um, on an ESG and, and impact mm. Uh, perspective. So if you've got your customers demanding you, that you do better, mm. you've got your employees agitating mm. and there's lots and lots of examples of, you know, in the past employees would come into a graduate program interview and say, okay, so um, how much am I going to get paid? Yeah. Um, uh, how's my bonus calculated and when does that get paid? Now they're saying, um, I just did a Google map search of your building and I noticed you didn't, didn't have any solar. Um, I went into yeah. your car park and I noticed you didn't have any batteries. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there, and you know, and, and I've spoken to some of your staff and you know those recycling bins, they're actually just going into the one bin at the end of the night. <laughs> you know, why is that? Um, so all these, you know, questions around, you know, the organisation and what they're doing and how they're delivering mm -hmm. it. Uh, and getting much deeper, and, and that's a generational shift. Yeah. You know, that is um, definitely, um, you know, it, it's it's the millennial generation, mm. but it's others mm. as well that are saying, okay, yep, mm. enough's enough. Mm. We need to we need to do better. Mm. And yeah, as I said, shareholders, customers, employees. If you, if all though, you know, if any one of those three mm. are putting pressure on you as as management or as mm. a board, you're going to make some changes. Mm. It's funny, isn't it? <laughs> I've definitely had summer Clark. Um, you know, people who are still at university asking about our DNI mm. programs, asking about our mm. female partner numbers, and and voting with their feet. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like it, when we would do the call up to people who may have gone to another firm and 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 citing these things yeah. as as reasons as well. So I yeah. think they're genuinely taking it very seriously. But Absolutely. it is funny that you know you've got your staff, your shareholders in a lot of cases, and your customers wanting it, and yeah. yet still. <laughs> Yeah, still a bit of pushback. <laughs> yeah, yeah, still there's that pushback. Um, just bringing it back to our audience who are, you know, a combination of commercial, legal audience at different levels. Mm. Some might be leaders, um, people leaders, others not. I think in Australia it's a good time because, we, you know, the government is doing things. We've got the Respect at Work recommendations being implemented. We've got the PM's gender pay um, bill. Mm. What advice would you give to people personally at work wanting to make a change not necessarily in a role that it's their day job mm. but do you have you know any nuggets or um you know tips to pass on in just trying to make an individual impact in their organization yeah i mean everyone has a role to play and i love dealing with 
organisations and corporates where there's internal agitators yeah. because not everyone can go off and start a not-for-profit or a social enterprise yeah. um, and you know do that sort of work. So we do need people in the corporate sector mm. um, or across all sectors that are agit agitators for change. Mm. Um, you know, to borrow that very famous, um, you know, uh, slogan from another company, just do it, you know, <laughs> um, just get in there and, 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 and do it, just start on something. And, you know, some of the coaching work that I do with people, you know, it, they, they want to make that shift, whether it be into ESG or impact, um, but they can't quite find that role, mm. but we're, we're, we're looking for ways to, all right, do this project and then embed some of your thinking in there and get to know this person and, and, and try to move things that way. Um, and, you know, my favourite African, well, my favourite quote, African proverb, you know, anyone that thinks they're too small to make a difference hasn't spent the night with a mosquito. Um, <laughs> you know, good. we've all got a part yeah. to play and, um, yeah, we, we can do it in our roles, we can do it in other roles within the organisations, mm -hmm. but particularly big organisations need people. Um, to, to, to start making those changes. As, as little as they think they may be, mm. just start. Mm. And the other thing I'd add, sort of on a broader level, is this is very high risk to, to keep ignoring oh, yeah. this. Yeah. Massive, yeah. massive problems yeah. uh, that you'll yeah. face with getting enough employees, with your reputation, just on every level in those three cohorts you just pointed out. And also it's high risk internally too, oh, right? I mean, how much, how much longer can you fake it? Yes. In, a, in a job, yeah. you know, it's you can't. And, be... and I know this through personal experience. I, I faked it for a long time because yeah. I had, you know, this really nice corporate role um, and, you know, was earning good money. And I had, you know, all these not-for-profit boards that I was on. And I thought I was a whole person because I, mm. you know, I had both. But in reality, you know, my working, the, my working environment wasn't the right environment. I was surrounded by people that were racist and bully and, mm. and, and where I got harassed you know, even as a 30, 40 plus, you know, plus mm -hmm. male. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought that was okay because I was getting That's, paid very handsomely to do yeah. that. And I'm not unique. Mm -hmm. Like there are a lot of people that live through that experience. But my message, particularly to women, um, is that do be very careful. Um, oh, yeah. this, is, this is not territory uh, mm. that comes without massive risks totally. for you. Mm. And when, we, when people say, oh, why don't women do this? Why don't they speak up? Because it's very understandably, yeah. they look at, the repercussions of doing yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, don't tell them that they don't have confidence or you know, patronise them. They look around and they see what happens to women who do. Mm -hmm. So my message to them is always join together. Mm -hmm. Go as a cohort yeah. um, and if you want real change, mm -hmm. gather together. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we see things happening. That's what happened with hashtag me too mm -hmm. yes. around the world. Mm -hmm. We have to be um, together to, mm -hmm. to, to get that shift. Mm -hmm. um, and we know all too well the horrifying consequences of women who do speak up and are then crucified. Um, and that happens all the time, which is another reason that I can't stand lean in. But we won't go there. Yes, um, <laughs> me too. Yeah. Me too. So I, I think just Sorry, gather, your, <laughs> yeah, yeah. gather your allies, I suspect. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yep. I think it's, it's a great point that you make about me too, where, you know, people actually talking about their experiences and normalising it. And it's it's really refreshing, Giles, as well, for you to then mm. reference your own experience because mm. people kind of think, you know, that a successful man doing well, you know, I, I think from the, you know, cultural perspective, mm. that until you're really talking about that as mm. well, mm. really in the context of anti-racism, at, at Clayton Newts we're doing anti-racism training, and it's it's just the next level. You know, people are quite shocked yeah. that someone who's a partner, who's you know, gone through the ranks, still experiences these yeah. microaggressions or yeah. not, just overt yeah. racism. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the other thing that, from my experience, I absolutely agree. Power in numbers, mm. but just having um, the confidence to talk about your lived experience. Yeah. Um, can make such a powerful impact, yeah. you know, for the people who aren't having that day-to-day yeah. -day experience themselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's um, it's important. You know, we've got to got to speak up about these things, otherwise, we we just don't get meaningful change. Mm. And that's you know one of the challenges. We just yeah, we we'll, we'll continue just to gloss over things, mm. um, and that's not you know you, you don't learn anything from that you mm. know individually or mm. you know as an organisation. Mm. So yeah, having the conversations, you know, have obviously having forums like this where um, you, you can have a conversation about it, but then importantly, let's move to action because mm. 
we can talk about this for a long time, uh, but you know, and we have been talking about it for a long time. <laughs> yeah, um, we need to we need to move, and we need to move a lot quicker. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time. It's been fascinating to talk to you both, as always. I really hope that our audience has taken something away um, from this session on DE and I, and that you'll take our call to action back to your workplaces and just do it. <laughs> Thanks so much.